All right, let's get down. Let's start off here. Aaron Sorkin, playwright, probably most famous for West Point, but I think he said something pretty darn intelligent here. I hope our leaders don't feel that they have to talk to us in monosyllables or break it down in easy to understand things. You know, we get smarter when people talk to us smart. So a lot of the things we may hear today may be new. The bar around inclusion and competitiveness is high. And it is high for all of us. So let's put on our thinking caps. And let's be serious and engage in a new frontier. A new frontier not in terms of it's brand new for everyone. But in terms of innovation and competitiveness, this lens has not yet been applied to underserved and disconnected populations. So are we ready to go? Yes, sir. Give me one more time. Are we ready to go? Yes, sir. All right, I like that in you. Let's level set a bit. What is the innovation economy? It's the period we're in right now latter part of last century, the early part of this century, that is marked by radical, radical socioeconomic changes that have been brought about by at least the convergence of these five factors. One, further globalized commerce. Second, democratized or widely available information. As was already pointed out in our smartphones, we've never had more availability of information in, in, a, in the history of the world than we do right now. Third, exponential growth of entrepreneurship throughout the world. Fourth, accelerated new knowledge creation. People like uh, Dr. Blaine and helping to create new knowledge and fostering new knowledge creation daily. The pace is accelerating. And finally, the interconnectedness of just about everything. The convergence of these five factors in one period, unlike we've ever seen before. The innovation economy. We're in an era of unprecedented, unprecedented opportunity. Never has it been more democratic. Information is widely available. Never has it been more egalitarian. We've moved from land ownership to a, and, and controlling the means of production to gray matter. Everyone has gray matter. Everyone can't own land or the means of production. More meritocratic. Incumbent wealth, incumbent class, they matter but they're not the determining factor. Make no mistake, we're not naive. This is not a perfect economic narrative or a perfect era, of course not. But there are more opportunities today than in any other time in the history of mankind. More than agrarian, more than industrial, this innovation age presents unprecedented opportunities. But it also comes with a squeeze, what we call the innovation economy squeeze. From the top down, probably all of us have heard of the Tom Friedman flat world phenomenon, right? Probably in the last 40 years, three to four billion new competitors globally. And I'm one who believes everyone is smart. Some have been uh, behind repressive regimes with an inability to express their genius. Those regimes are falling, and those that are not falling have adjusted China to incorporate innovation within an existing structure. And they want the same things we want. Hey, we're smart, they're smart, but let's get it off. But there's also what we talk less about is the bottom-up squeeze of tech adoption and integration. My grandfather came to Detroit, Michigan in 1920. 
Worked for him from Tuskegee, Alabama. Picked up my grandmother in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Worked for Henry Ford from 1920 to 1957. I still have his retirement watch. The Reverend Lieutenant Beecher Campbell Sr. That's my grandpa. When he worked at Ford, he worked at the Rouge plant. The Rouge plant was the largest plant in the world. At its peak, one plant employed 100,000 people. Let me say that again. One plant employed 100,000 people. Now the whole global company has never been more productive than it is right now. That's about 160,000 people. What we're witnessing with tech adoption and integration is productivity through the roof. But the decoupling of productivity from new jobs. The decoupling of business productivity from new jobs. In the 20th century, the hallmark of economic recovery was business productivity. Why? Because it necessarily meant you needed new bodies, new jobs to meet new demand. And we all know that is no longer the case. So, it begs the question, where will we go from here? Let's further level set. Let's look at some economic or business productivity numbers. And let me also say, some of you have gone to economic conferences over the years. You've probably heard, you may have heard advocates say, for example, if black people were a nation, we had one trillion dollars of buying power, we'd be the X largest economy in the world. That's the poor match. That's income. Now I'm all for high income, beginning with my own. <laughs> but income by itself is not the gap closer. Income is derived from others' wealth. So let's look at our economic and business productivity numbers. Over the last several years, the last statistical period, black entrepreneurship increased by over 60%. 1.9 million black-owned businesses. Only 107,000 even have employees. And that's up 13%. 1.9 million businesses employ uh, uh, 900,000 people. Hmm. At the end of the day, 13% of the population produce less than 1% of the nation's GDP and employ less than a half percent of adults. Bill, this is not some advocacy or some standardized quota of economic contribution. What if it was 2%? What a low bar. Imagine a positive ripple throughout our community. Okay. Let's look at our Latino brothers and sisters. 2.3 million businesses, 43% growth in entrepreneurship, 1.9 million have employees, tremendous growth in payroll, and at the end of the day, 16 to 17% of the population produces less than 2.5% of GDP. Okay. Let's look at our Combined, if black and Latino contribution to GDP went from 3.5% to 5.5%, and women went from about 10% to 15%, we'd add $1 trillion, an untold number of jobs to our economy. This is our imperative. Let's look at Mississippi. In last statistical period, Mississippi black-owned businesses increased by 62%. Thumbs up. Look at the U.S. average revenue for black-owned businesses. Not very impressive. But let's look at Mississippi. Let's look at the Jackson Metro. Let's look at the Jackson black-owned business percent of gross regional product. 
the end of the day, the city of Jacksonville by itself is 80% black. The region is about 48% black. Produce less than 2% of gross regional product. Again, it's not about a quota, but it is about untapped opportunity. What if that number was 5%? What if 80% of the population was producing 5% of gross regional product? Imagine the wealth and opportunity that would be created right here. This frames our imperative. And it begs the threshold question. From where will black Mississippians, black Jacksonians, new jobs and wealth and enterprise come if we don't help create them? From where will they come? Will they materialize out of thin air? Of course not. Triggers a new thing we call TAP, T-A-P-I-N. Now, I know you brainiacs out there like, that's not a word. You're right, it's not a word. <laughs> so it must be an acronym, right? Let's think about it. Thought, advocacy, policy, investment, market. New thought and advocacy to produce new economic narratives. That's why we are here. We are producing a new economic narrative in Mississippi and in Jackson. But that narrative must inform policy. Yes. Policy is defined as influential actors' expression of important public objectives. Influential actors' expression of important public objectives. <clears throat> could be legislative, could be private sector, corporate, philanthropic, communities themselves demanding new opportunities. That's policy. Why is policy so important? Because investment never precedes policy. Can I say that again? Yes, sir. Investment never precedes policy. And if you want the market to do something, you better tell them it's important and provide some resources for them to do it. The primacy of policy. Sun Tzu, Chinese architect of strategy. The victorious army first obtains conditions for victory, then seeks to do battle. The defeated army first seeks to do battle, then obtain conditions for victory. The conditions for victory begin with policy. Influential actors, expression of important public objectives. The primacy of policy. Here's how it looks. What we're doing now is momentum and build up. New thought, new advocacy, new relationships, new breaking down silos as the mayor called. Policy is the breakthrough. Investment and market is a constant maintenance and sustaining action over and over and over. It's a never ending process. Inclusive competitors. Important note interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary. Not just multidisciplinary, but interdisciplinary. Policies, practices, strategies, and metrics designed to improve the performance of underserved Americans in our innovation economy. That innovation economy we already defined and manifested in innovation ecosystems and clusters, emerging industry sectors, and other areas that are critical to overall economic competitiveness. That's what we're talking about. Showing up, competing, self-activity, self-efficacy, pull down 
economics. I never heard pull down economics. Heard of trickle down economics? Yeah. Trickle down, the individual waits for opportunity. Like mono from hat to fall in your lap. Pull down is empowering the individual to reach up and pull down that. That's what this is about. Pull down economics. We wait for no one. Let's equip a population that has not been equipped with new tools to reach up and pull down economic value. Yeah. That's what inclusive competitiveness is about. Keep in mind, folks, this is not exotic. This is not otherworldly. Inclusive competitiveness is the third move. Here's what I mean. Obviously, the notable Silicon Valley, perhaps Boston, Austin, Texas, Research Triangle area. These are all 60, 50 year strategies for those communities. They're the first moves. Okay? After that, you have the rest of us, the second moves, probably 20 year or so strategies around innovation. Inclusion is the third move. We follow the same path and respond to the same needs that created the first and second moves. This stuff is not new. We are applying a lens to new populations. Let's not get it twisted. It's not new, but the application to new populations is new. Law of inclusive competitiveness, and we believe this just like we believe what, must, what goes up must come down. We believe it's as firm as the law of gravity. No region state can sustainably increase economic competitiveness without growing enough innovative employees and entrepreneurs to actually create and then take advantage of that economic competitiveness. And here's the upshot. If your region's or state's economic competitiveness goals do not focus on broad inclusion, you simply will not, indeed cannot, as a matter of economic prosperity physics, if you will. We will not have enough contributors to build competitive, sustainable regional, state, local, We believe that is as firm as the law of gravity. Primacy of inclusive competitiveness. We live in a capitalist economy. I'm a capitalist. In capitalist economies, the best financial investment and employment opportunities generally, generally flow to the most competitive assets, the most competitive people and companies. Terms, and you hear them a lot, inclusive innovation, tech inclusion, inclusive capitalism cannot be achieved without inclusive competitors. These things, these wonderful concepts, are the result of having more competitive assets. The primacy of inclusive competitiveness is building more competitive assets in a capitalist economy. It's about contribution, folks. Which brings us to your handout. This is the framework. And keep in mind, there's complete freedom within the framework. The framework is proscriptive, not prescriptive. Okay? What did we talk about? It's all enabled by policy. Policy 
Legacy enables the entire framework. Okay? The top and bottom are the two outcomes that inclusive competitiveness is intended to achieve. One, higher value intra intrapreneurial employees. People on your teams in, in an employment employee-employer relationship who act entrepreneurially on behalf of the company in their roles. Not passive, they're assertive. They look to create value for the employee and certainly look to participate in the value they help to create. The second is higher growth entrepreneurial enterprises. You saw the stats. Those statistics are a reflection of underserved populations being disconnected from the best opportunities in any market. The default conversation around economic inclusion doesn't bring along competitiveness. It runs to small business, supplier diversity, construction, all good stuff, but not necessarily aligned with the major growth thrust in regional economies. It's not just economic inclusion. It's inclusion and competitiveness. What enables those outcomes? One, inculcating new community economic narrative. That's what we're doing here and other places in the United States. This narrative is not in our communities. That's OK. When I was in Detroit doing this thing a couple of years ago, my brother, he's a minister up there. During the post-mortem, he said, Johnny, my family called him Johnny. He said, man, that's good stuff. Then he said, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I said, David, you're right. So basically, I'm off the hook. I did my job. He said, no, your job is to make the horse thirsty. Yeah, y'all got that. Yeah, that's just what I just did. Yeah. yeah. Your job is to make the horse thirsty. That's what this is. Inculcating new economic narratives in our communities. Supporting new education leadership. I'm a big fan of Dr. Rhea and the Center for Education Innovation. That's the kind of leadership that markets need. And it needs to be supported. Not in a passive, half-hearted, sappy kind of way, but in a firm conviction way. New education leadership. I stopped by Seattle's Best Coffee this morning. I'm staying at the Hilton Garden. Add me an espresso, iced coffee too. If I had drank a warm cup, I'd still be sweating. Right <laughs> so I drank an iced coffee. But they sell all kinds of things, lattes, this, that, and the other. 30 years ago, none of you would have imagined ordering, except Brother Coleman who's out on the West Coast. The rest of us would have never imagined ordering a cafe latte or a fancy cup of coffee that cost $4 until it was off. Huh? Our communities haven't been offered a cafe latte yet. That's all. Feel me? All right. Enable new organization leadership. The not-for-profit infrastructure, the leadership infrastructure in our communities serve great ends. The challenge is most of them are social and human services education services, and direct services. We have not one what's called keystone organizations or trim tab organizations that are high leverage kinds of organizations whose service and leadership is aggregating the market, leading the market, not just delivering programs. 
Nowhere in the nation is there a regional or local strategy around inclusion and competitiveness. We do have programs. Programs are fleeting. Strategies and North Stars are enduring. We need organizations that work with others, intermediary organizations, not just direct social, human, and education organizations. You don't need a lot of them, but you need a couple of great ones. In underserved communities, they don't exist. Four, conduct new regional economic competitiveness exploration, selection, and prioritization. The exploration, selection, and prioritization focuses on broad impact opportunities. Absolutely, we need the biosciences, life sciences, we need the advanced manufacturing, we need all of these things. But we also need to look at using the in, uh, our competitiveness tools in new ways that engender even greater prosperity and begin to select and prioritize those areas that can bring along many more Americans. By no means does this mean abandon the existing. We need those too. They're well vet, and most of them are spot on. But we need to complement those strategies with new approaches that bring along even more Americans. And finally, implement new policies processes, practices, and yes, programs. Time for exploration, experimentation. In the minority servicing, underserved infrastructure, there is zero tolerance for risk. You get a grant to do a program, if you screw that program up, you're dead. There's all kind of risk tolerance in the innovation account. They bet you though. You gotta withstand the scrutiny. But they embrace the risk. Keep in mind the opposite of risky or the opposite of risk averse is not risky. It's risk astute. Feel me? So let's be risk astute in introducing new elements of risk tolerance into this exploration. We, none of us, have the answer. We have frameworks, and that's why there is freedom within these frameworks to find out what works. We don't have those findings. We need to find it out, disseminate it, replicate it, and scale it. And we don't know. Folks, I echo the mayor's sentiments. I echo pastor's sentiments. This is a unique time. It is perhaps pregnant with opportunity. And we're all the parents. How about that to stretch it a metaphor and mercy? <laughs> My time is here. Together, we have an opportunity to be an inclusive and competitive encounter. Let's join the movement. In fact, let's lead the national movement. Love you, Jackson. Let's get down.